Hi everyone. In chapter six, we're gonna talk about relationships between quantitative variables. We talked a little bit about association between two categorical variables when we discussed independence in chapter three. Um, but in chapters six and seven, we're gonna talk about the association between quantitative variables very extensively. I wanna start off with um, this data set and we used this in a previous um, video. It's all the vehicles made in 2018, and it looks at their fuel economy. So we've got city fuel economy, highway combined, um, there's the annual fuel cost, the fuel economy rating, and then the um, carbon dioxide emissions from the tailpipe. And this sample had a sample size of 1,273. So this is just a snippet of the data set. So what if I wanted to look at the relationship between the quantitative variables in this data set? So say I wanted to look at the relationship between city fuel economy and highway fuel economy, or the combined fuel economy and the annual fuel cost, or whatever two quantitative variables you wanted to pick from this data set. One of the first things we do is create a scatter plot. So scatter plots are really good ways for observing relationships between two quantitative variables. Um, and what a scatter plot does is it takes the, um, the data set from one variable, becomes all the y coordinates, and the data set from the other variable becomes all the x coordinates. And I just flip those. This would be x, and this would be y. Um, and it plots it. So here I have... Um, several different uh, pairs of quantitative variables from the previous data set. So on this first slide, I've got city fuel economy and highway fuel economy. On the second graph here, I've got annual fuel cost and the fuel economy rating. Remember that the fuel economy rating was a discrete quantitative variable from one to 10. Um, on this third one here, I've got the combined fuel economy rating with the annual fuel cost. And on the last one, I have the, um, the carbon dioxide emissions from the tailpipe with the annual fuel cost. So this is just a couple of scatter plots. And what's nice is that you can immediately see um, trends, patterns, and if there was an extreme outlier, we'd be able to notice right away. So one of the things that we like to do is describe scatter plots. And when we describe a scatter plot, we look at four different things. We first talk about the form. Now, in this class, we're only going to talk about linear relationships. So when we discuss the form, the form is either going to be linear or nonlinear. We also want to discuss the direction of that um, linear form, if it is a linear form. And if it's going uphill, it's positive, and if it's going downhill, it's negative. Strength is a big one. We want to talk about the strength of the association. Is it strong? Is it moderate? Or is it weak? Or is there no association whatsoever? And then outliers. Um, we won't get into the difference between influential and non-influential outliers, but it is important to note any outliers that you see in a scatter plot. So looking at that first graph that I had a couple of slides ago, um, I was looking at the relationship between the city fuel economy and the highway fuel economy. And if I was asked to describe the scatter plot, I would say that the form is linear. Um, it's not gonna create a straight line, but I can see that these four have a linear pattern to them. Um, in chapter seven, we'll actually look at how to find the line that fits this linear pattern, but the form is basically linear. Um, it's going in an uphill direction, so the direction that is positive, and this is, has a strong association. Um, we'll talk about the difference between strong, moderate, and weak as we look at more graphs. And in looking at this, there aren't any noticeable outliers. Um, some people might look at this one, 
but it's it's questionable as to whether or not that's an outlier. So these were the other three graphs that we looked at. Um, so I want to just quickly describe each one of these. Um, for this first one, again, remember that the fuel economy rating was a discrete uh, quantitative variable from 1 to 10. Um, so all the values are going to be whole numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4. And so that's why it looks like this step here. Um, but this definitely has a linear relationship. Um, the direction's negative. It's going downhill. It's a strong linear relationship. And this over here, I was thinking that that might be an outlier. For the second one, this is a nonlinear relationship. There's a clear curve here. The direction's still negative. It's going downhill, and it's very strong. The, the points are clustered together very well, and I don't see any outliers. In the third one, again, this would be linear. We're not looking for perfect lines. We're looking for linear um, forms. The direction's positive, and it's also a strong relationship, and I don't see any outliers. Here's a few more um, examples, and I, I know you can't see any of the uh, variables, but I the hardest thing to talk about when we talk about um, a scatter plot is the strength. So I wanted to give you some examples that weren't always strong because all four of the previous examples that I gave you had strong relationships. So um, this first one here, this would be a moderately strong linear relationship. The, the points aren't clustered really close together. They're spread out more. But there's still definitely somewhat of a, a linear form going here. This bottom one, <clears throat> this is really hard to see. Uh, and I'm going to show you how to actually find a correlation coefficient so we could talk about this more. Um, but this is actually an example of a weak negative association. These points are really spread out but you can still kind of see how they go in a downward direction, linearly. Whereas this top one up here, this is, what we call it a cloud of points. They're all over the place. So this is showing no association whatsoever. And when there's no association, then we don't talk about form and direction or anything like that. So how do we actually measure strength? Well, that's what a correlation coefficient does for us. It measures the strength of a linear relationship. It's a numerical value, and they calculate it by taking each x, y value. So let's say we're looking at this point here, and this is an x comma y. It finds the z-score for the x value, the z-score for the y value, multiplies it together, and then does this for every single point. It adds all of those products and then divides by the sample size minus one. Now remember the sample size for this was 1,273. So obviously this is not a calculation we would ever want to do by hand. We use, <laughs> we use our technology. So doing all of that calculation gave us a correlation coefficient of r, that's the letter we use to describe the correlation coefficient, so r equals 0 0.91. This is a very strong linear correlation, um, and I'll talk about the properties of a correlation coefficient in a second, but this is considered very strong. So properties of a correlation coefficient. A correlation coefficient, r, is always between negative one and one. You're never, never going to see a correlation coefficient of negative 2.5 or positive 1.3, right? It's only going to be between negative one and one. And <clears throat> a negative correlation coefficient implies a negative association, and a positive uh, correlation coefficient implies a positive association. And we could see that from the previous slide. So this had a positive 
linear association. So we got a positive correlation coefficient. If we had a correlation coefficient of exactly 1 or exactly negative 1, then our points would make a perfect straight line and they would be close together. Uh, you are never going to see that in real world data unless, unless uh, I would say unless there's some kind of mistake going on. But I've never seen that. The correlation coefficient, remember it's the product of the z-scores, so it actually has no units. We call it a pure number. Um, it's still a measurement, which is interesting, but it's a measurement without any units. It also um, doesn't depend on the units of the variables. So for example, if I had data in inches and then I um, changed it all to feet, it wouldn't change the correlation coefficient. Also, it doesn't matter which variable you have as x and which variable you have as y. If you switch them around, you're still going to get exactly the same correlation coefficient. But the correlation coefficient is very sensitive to outliers. And that's why we always look at the correlation coefficient in conjunction with the scatter plot. We want to look at the scatter plot to see if it's appropriate, one, to find a correlation coefficient, and two, if there are any outliers. So the purpose of a correlation coefficient is to allow us to discuss the strength of the association, um, but it can get a little bit um, subjective. So here's a scale that I use. Basically, a lower correlation coefficient that's close to zero, so something in between here. Oops, there we go. So a correlation coefficient between negative 0.2 and positive 0.2 is essentially no correlation. Um, you don't have to have a correlation coefficient of exactly zero to have no correlation. Um, if I had a correlation coefficient of uh, 0.07, that is close enough to zero that we would never look at that relationship. It doesn't have a correlation. A weak correlation would be something between 0 0.2 and 0 0.5. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, but that would be considered a weak correlation. A medium or moderate correlation would be anything between 0 0.5 and 0 0.8. And again, doesn't matter if we're looking at positive or negative. And then a strong correlation is anything from 0 0.8 to 1. And again, you're most likely never going to get that perfect one. Um, so remember that in this previous slide, we got a correlation coefficient of 0 0.9. So that is a very strong positive linear association. So let's look at all the other graphs that we looked at and talk about whether or not it's even reasonable to find a correlation coefficient. So we have the uh, following conditions. First of all, you have to have variables that are quantitative before you can find a correlation coefficient. The scatter plot should be reasonably straight and you shouldn't have any strong outliers. So um, in this one, this was a good, this first one, this was a good scatter plot. It showed a pretty strong negative linear relationship, so it would be appropriate to find a correlation coefficient here. Same thing with this second one. Uh, this is a pretty strong positive linear association, so it makes sense to find a correlation coefficient. Uh, this bottom one down here, this was our moderately strong. It's hard to see that reasonably straight. That's a pretty tricky um, tricky word there, this reasonably idea. Um, but it would make sense to find a, a correlation coefficient for this graph here. This one here showed a weak relationship. It, we talked about how, how it had a weak negative relationship. And it might be kind of um, up in the air on whether or not it would be appropriate to find a correlation coefficient here. I don't know that we could say this is really reasonably straight. Um, 
But there's no outliers, and the correlation coefficient would just confirm that this is a weak relationship. <clears throat> this graph was that cloud of dots, and it's got no association. We wouldn't want to find a, corre uh, a correlation coefficient for this. And this bottom one here, this is not linear. A correlation coefficient only works for linear forms. Okay, so let's look at an example. So we've got two scatter plots. Um, I want to describe the scatter plots and then match it up with the correlation coefficient. So looking at this first one, um, it looks like it is a pretty strong negative linear correlation. And since it's negative, I know that the um, correlation coefficient must be negative. So I have a choice between negative 0.977 and negative 0.021. Since this is a strong relationship, the correlation coefficient is going to be close to 1. Because the uh, direction is negative, uh, that's why we're going to have a negative correlation coefficient. So negative 0.977 would be the correct correlation coefficient for this graph. Negative 0.021, that's a very weak correlation. For this other graph, we have a positive relationship here, but the points are kind of scattered out. I would call this a moderate relationship. So when we have a choice between our two positive correlation coefficients, 0.736 and 0.951, the one that matches that moderate relationship would be 0 0.736. So um, I want to look at how to find a scatter plot on your calculator and how to um, calculate the correlation coefficient with your calculator. So we're going to look at a much smaller data set here. This is um, some the selling price and the size of a house for some um, homes in suburban Denver. So we've got the size in square feet, and notice that the selling price is in thousands of dollars. So this first um, XY relationship, this house had 2,521 square feet, and the selling price was $400,000. So how do we make this scatter plot using our calculator? We're going to use the same stat plot button that we've used to create histograms and box plots. First, we want to put the data into L1 and L2. So you can just put the first one into L1 and the second one into L2. So um, in my calculator video here, I'm going to show you that I put the data into L1 and L2, and then how to do the um, stat plot. You're going to go to stat plot and then do that same zoom 9. So I go to stat and edit and put the data into L1 and L2. Then we'll go to second stat plot. I'm going to turn the first plot on, and this very first graph is the scatter plot. I have L1 and L2 as my X and Y list. And then I'm going to go to zoom 9. And I've got the same scatter plot that I have over here. How would I describe this scatter plot? It's a little bit harder to describe a scatter plot with so few points. Um, but I would still say that the form is linear. It's positive and it's strong with no outliers. Notice that even though the question is asking me to describe it, I'm not writing a paragraph. I'm just hitting those four things that we should talk about. Um, I'm speculating that this is a strong relationship. It's kind of hard to tell, but I would I want to look at the correlation coefficient and make sure that it's I'm measuring that strength and looking at the actual strength of this relationship, especially since there are no outliers. So in the next video, um, we're going to find the correlation coefficient. <clears throat> Remember that in order to do that,
I have to make sure that the variables are quantitative. They are. We want to make sure that the scatter plot is reasonably straight in form, which it is, and that there are no outliers. So I've, I have the conditions set. Um, again, this is still in L1 and L2. Um, but the first thing that we have to do is turn on our diagnostics. Now, what's nice about this is once you do it once, unless you reset your calculator, you should never have to do it again. Once you turn them on, you actually have to go in and turn them off if you want to, which you will never want to. So turn them on and leave them on. There are two ways that you can do this, and <clears throat> sorry, it, it depends on the model of your calculator. So my video is gonna show two different ways of turning on the diagnostics. Then we're going to go to stat and calc, and we're gonna choose lin reg, and the next chapter talks about linear regression, but that's the command that we use, and it will give us our correlation coefficient. So first, um, turning on the diagnostics. You can do that in two different ways. You can either do it with this mode button, but if you don't see it there, then it will be under catalog here. So I'm first gonna look at the mode button. If you click on mode, all the way down, if you see it, it's right there, it's the blue one. Go ahead and turn it on and hit enter and you're done. You've turned on your diagnostics and you can just quit. If you don't see that under mode, then go to your catalog. So you have to go to second zero and then you have to go all the way down to diagnostics and they're in alphabetical order. So just scroll down to diagnostics. And you can see here there's diagnostic on. You're gonna hit enter and enter again and it'll say done. Now your diagnostics are on, you'll never have to do that again. Go to stat and edit. And then you're gonna go down to lin reg, which is number four. We have our L1 and L2. You're never gonna need anything in frequency list or the storage and hit calculate. And this R is the correlation coefficient. So the correlation coefficient for this is 0 0.90. So that confirms that this is a strong positive linear correlation. One of the things that is really important is to, um, is to talk about how correlation is not the same as causation. Just because two things have a relationship does not mean that if we change one of the variables, it will automatically change the other variable. That implies causation. And a lot of times when we have relationships between variables, there's actually an underlying cause or lurking or confounding variables. Oops, right? Some other reason that's showing the relationship between these two variables. Um, if we did want to actually show causation, we'd have to do an experiment. So if you go on Google and you just Google something like um, funny correlations, you can find a lot of things that are pretty funny and how they're correlated. And a lot of it's because there's some kind of lurking variable underneath. So I found this one because I thought it was funny. Um, so it says, eat enough chocolate and you'll win a Nobel. So if you want to boost blood flow to your brain and potentially slow cognitive decay, consume flavanols. The plant compound is found in green tea and cocoa and are great for getting blood into your noggin. That made New York doctor Franz Masserly wonder... Would a nation of bonbon eaters be more intellectually accomplished than a country that didn't consume as much cocoa? In a tongue-in-cheek 2012 paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine, he found that countries that ate a lot of chocolate also won Nobel Prizes. Masserly published the study with a wink, but some media outlets took the news seriously, failing to see that a confounding variable was at play, and that variable was wealth. <laughs> 
a richer country like Switzerland, which has 26 Nobel winners, will have more quality scientific research as well as better stocked shelves of chocolate. Um, so just one more slide to kind of talk about how we should be careful in discussing correlation so that we're not implying causation. So let's say that there's an association, a positive association between salary and productivity. What you don't want to say is that raising salaries will increase productivity. That implies that there's a causal relationship. Instead, it's better to say that employees with higher salaries tend to be more productive. That implies correlation. Or if we have a really high correlation coefficient, like 0.97, for red wine consumption and cholesterol level. So it's a negative relationship, so this would improve that drinking, improve an incorrect assumption, would say that this proves that drinking more wine lowers your cholesterol. Um, that's, it does not prove that. That would imply a causal relationship. Instead, we want to say, there is a strong negative association between red wine consumption and cholesterol level.